Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. I am Karen Matzo, which you can't see because I need to rename myself. Um, I am Karen, and I am the Professional De Development Director at Demonstrated Success. I'm hoping maybe some of you came to our last um, paraprofessional webinar. And we're just really happy to have you here today. We want to provide some free professional development for our paraprofessionals, mostly in New Hampshire and Vermont, I think. So welcome to all of you. And um, I'm going to introduce Laura, or Laura's going to introduce herself, but a little background. Laura's been working with us for a few years on and off. She does a lot of virtual work for us because she lives in Maryland. Um, she's a lovely, smart, and bright Multilanguage, multilingual learner teacher. Um, and um, she's going to pass on some information today. So, and I'll also talk to you a little on the next slide about some norms or some process info. So, thanks for coming today. Um, you're all muted. And, but I'm happy to unmute you. Like, if you raise your hand and you'd like to talk or ask a question verbally, I'm going to keep looking at the attendee list. And just like I, I um, unmuted Angela a little earlier, I'm happy to unmute anybody. Um, but in general, we're going to keep you muted just for the sake of noise. And um, you're going to have opportunity to write in the chat. You're going to have opportunity maybe to participate in a Padlet, which we'll show you how to use. Um, and Laura and I are happy to stay on for any questions at the end. And what else? Um, at the end of each section, we'll have some question opportunity for questions, and there'll be a little um, survey at the end of this just to express kind of what you learned and what you liked and maybe what could have been better. And um, then within 48 hours, you will be getting a certificate for the time spent and a link to resources that Laura is going to share with you. Okay, so that's that. Awesome. And you know you're not presenting, right? Laura? Anyone? Mm. I, it says I'm sharing my okay, hold on. Let me try again. <laughs> Thank you for being patient as I try to share my screen. Let me get this going. It was sharing and then it deleted, right? It did. I can present for you if you want. Just let me know. Okay, give me two seconds and I will get this up. Welcome to everyone. I'm going to go into the chat just to make sure nobody needs anything in particular at this moment. Okay. Awesome. I'm, I have lost my tools. That's my problem. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Um, basic. Okay. Can everyone see that now? Yes. Okay, great. And I hope it has the audio. That's what I was trying to troubleshoot, which made me lose it. So if the audio doesn't work eventually, please just let me know. Um, but I would like to welcome you all here. Um, thank you for coming. And hopefully you can take something meaningful from today's webinar. Um, the first thing I have here for you is, and this is what um, Karen will send out to you. I have provided a Padlet for oops, a Padlet for you all that has resources and more information if any of this um, whets your appetite and wants makes you want to read more. So um, we will be sending this out for, for you to see. You can use your phone and if you go to take a picture with, of the QR code, it should just pop right up. Um, so that is for you. Um, I wanted to start by getting to know you guys. If you could in the chat answer, you can answer all the questions, that would be the best. But if you are willing to share what grade levels you support, um, your name, I forgot to mention that, please introduce yourself, your name, where you are. And then number two, how familiar are you with working with multilingual learners? So that's any learner who speaks more than one language, and then a personal question, how many languages do you speak? Um, it could be, you could be a novice at a new language or learned it in high school. I would love to hear from you. So I'm gonna give you a minute just to put that information in the chat. Awesome. So New Hampshire, push in science, great. Who else? 
Grade six, Margaret. Yep, grade six, and grade, grade seven. Grade eight. Great. Hanover. Yep, they're coming fast now. Grades nine through 12, no other language. Some French. Yeah. I hear German, Spanish. Awesome. So you guys can see there, we are all coming here um, with different backgrounds and different um, experiences with language. And that's really my focus here is to give you some insight. Not very familiar, but we have lots of students. Okay, perfect. Um, excellent. And Karen, if you see anything else that I should know, please yell it out because um, it's hard to keep track of all these moving parts. But I wanted to start just showing some gratitude. Um, I, myself, I'm gonna introduce myself in a second, but I have been an educator for, oh, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, I was um, laughing, sorry. No, that was my dad. I was laughing at Vicky who's trying to learn on Duolingo. Oh I yeah, that. we'll talk about that too. So, wait, just um, one more thing, sorry. Somebody speaks Korean. Yes, speaks Korean. Korean. Okay. All right. I'm getting all excited. Keep going, Laura. Awesome. And background in TLL. Awesome. T-L-E-L-L. So this is a quote I found um, in an article in Ed Week, and it was a principal writing to her paraprofessionals. And I just want to take a moment to validate and shout out all the amazing work you do. Um, we are so grateful to have each of you um, and I, I second everything that she wrote in this email that you are the backbone of the school in so many ways. Um, you can see things that teachers can't see. You know the kiddos in a different way. You have tight relationships with the kids who need us the most. There's no way to overvalue the contribution you make. And in many ways, paras are the heart of the school. Um, you truly, um, you know the ins and outs and you are that oil that keeps things running. Um, when someone's missing, you could be a substitute. So I just want to thank you for all you do and know that you are extremely valued. And the kids, it's for the kids and you create meaningful, lasting relationships. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Laura Schreiber. I do live in um, Balt outside of Baltimore now, but I am from Connecticut. So, you know, I have that New England blood. Um, so I went to school at Wheaton College and after I, I studied to be an elementary school teacher and, um, I got a Fulbright and taught in Taiwan where I developed curriculum and taught, um, elementary school English there. And after that moved to DC where I moved in with my husband and, um, I taught in Fairfax County. I taught fourth and fifth grade, um, content, full content. So general education. And I went to get my master's at University of Virginia, where I really, oh, we lived in, you lived in Taiwan too. We can talk forever. Um, <laughs> but through my master's, I, I've i always had this passion for cross-cultural um, understanding and international education. So I did get my accreditation to become an ESOL teacher. When I moved to Baltimore County Public Schools, I then became an ESOL teacher. I have been doing lots of professional developments on the side on my spare time, um, and I do have three children, so that's me. Um, I learned Spanish as I was growing up, and I have lived in Spanish-speaking countries, but I would not say I'm fluent, but the majority of my students speak Spanish, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, when I was in Taiwan, I did get thrown into Mandarin um, survival skills. So I am familiar with learning a language um, and the difficulties, and I'm hoping you can kind of connect with that as well as you think about our students. So just a little background on what I'm working with so that you can kind of get a sense. So in Baltimore County Public Schools, we are a very large county and we are outside of Baltimore. Um, there are a total of 12,000 ELs, which we actually are starting to call MLs. ELs stands for English learners, but MLs stand for multilingual learners. And if you think about why that is, um, it's assuming that English learners, sometimes we call them second language English learners, right? And the truth is they could, many students know more than two languages. Um, so it's really 
focusing on that bolty aspect, okay? Um, and in total in our county, there are 104 languages um, and then 123 represented. So extremely diverse. I am in an elementary school. I'm one of five full-time um, ESOL or ELD teachers, and I provide professional support as well. 48% um, of my population is an ESOL learner or a multilingual learner, and the majority in my school is Spanish. And one of the things I'm always asked is, what, what language do you speak? Do you teach in another language? Um, and that's a misconception, right? It's impossible for us to teach um, in 104 different languages, right? So it's really important as an ESOL teacher to have the lens of language and to be familiar with your students' languages. Um, so that's something to always consider. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little while. So today on our agenda, um, I'm here just to deepen your knowledge on what it means to learn um, this says second language acquisition, but multi-languages um, and how the human brain learns language and how that really affects our students, okay? And the second piece is I'm going to be sharing some strategies and some tools um, that are research-based that you can use in your own setting and in your own schools. So the first question, I mentioned this before, but what are your experiences in learning a language? If you feel comfortable raising your hand, if you feel comfortable putting it in the chat, but I also have a, oh, nope, that's the next one. Sorry, sorry, Karen. Um, so for this one, if you just wanna shout out, I did put some pictures here that were meaningful to me. Um, this first one of uh, learning Spanish, I just remember the conjugation of verbs and um, the rote learning and that repetition. So that's why I put that there. Um, and then this picture of ordering um, ordering duck. I When I was in Taiwan, that survival language, I learned how to order food better than anything else. And I learned how to travel in a taxi and it was a very different experience learning language. So learning a language doesn't look one way, right? Some of us are doing Duolingo, that's one way, but immersion is a whole nother game and that can be more of that survival language. Good, I see high school language class 40 years ago. Good, and what do you think about when you think of high school language? Do you think of um, a lot of interaction, survival, or are you thinking of more repetition, repetition, and practice? That's something I want you to think about as well. I'm, so, I'm embarrassed to say I think of cheating in my Spanish class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that awful? No, it's reality. I mean, learn. I don't know about you, but I feel it was hard. I was learning Spanish, it's so hard, and I felt so <laughs> vulnerable. And I yes. have stories of being in the language lab on the computer having to record myself and that feeling of like, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> so good. Uh, oh my gosh. So some of us have lived in Prague that floor yes, and the immersion. Yes. That's the best. Yes. And, you know, research shows that full immersion is truly how you will learn the most quickly. Um, but we're going to talk about how that develops. Okay. Um, and I also just, the reason I'm, I'm really trying to tap into your background knowledge, that's going to link to later, because if you can tap into your own experiences, you can really truly connect with what your students are dealing with as well. Awesome. Peace Corps in Guatemala. Yes. Survival repetition. Yes. Yes. Close attachment to your dictionary. Luckily, we have a bit more technology these days, but it's still difficult. All right. So. Now I wanna transition you from being a student to being um, more in that paraprofessional role and the teacher role. And I wanna know what do you do to help your ELs or MLs um, and struggling learners achieve success in the classroom? And you're gonna notice that I, I'm gonna share this with you. I'm gonna put it in the chat. I have it to put in the chat, Laura. You did it. I beat you. Did you do it? Okay. Yeah, I, did. <laughs> I already had it in my thing. So. Laura, put that in the chat. That's going to take you, the link that she just put into the chat is going to take you to a tool called Jamboard. And some of you might be familiar with it and some of you may not be. Um, so 
I am going to just jump in and just really show you, oh, Laura, actually, why don't you just go ahead? Yeah, since I you can do it. Yeah. The best way to do it, I would think, is just to do a sticky note. And if did you all see where that is? It looks like a little sticky note. And you'll just write, what do you do to help your ELs and struggling learners? Um, I work in small groups. Okay, I'll send the link one more time. It's in the chat, but I'll do it Got one more it. time. Um, but as you can see, it'll we'll start collecting sticky notes. Um, and we can see if we have some new ideas, if we can share some thoughts here. I just put it into the chat um, because I, I had to change the access to everyone as opposed to just the panelists. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, and while you guys type, I am going to just mention that, um, you know, English language learners, we're going to, we're going to be talking about some background information, but we're also going to be talking about some tools that will help not just ELs, but all types of learners. Um, whether it's an English, native English speaker who may have another learning disability, but truly any, any student can benefit from the things we're talking about. So if you can put that on there and good job, you consciously speak oh, slowly and playing. love it. Here, I'm gonna write that down for you. Speak slowly and clearly. If you look on the side, there's that little, I don't have any ML learners at the moment. Good. I worked with a Russian student one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Small group games, speak slowly, work with a buddy, use manipulatives. Somebody changed the color. That's great. Love it. Check for understanding. Help them integrate into class. So if we were in person, I would, I would question you a little more because that's great. I want to know what you do like what are some examples of integrating what are some things that work for you what are some ways for you to check understanding um but yes all of these are absolutely right on ways to organize extended products um projects ready start done excellent all right we will continue collecting these you have access to this you can keep looking at this um You'll see here, I'm going to go back to my, my slides. So if you want to transition back to me, um, I, I am along the way going to be showing you some different strategies, different techniques that um, could be used just, you know, to spark your interest. But if I were in person with you, this would have been a chalk talk where we really wrote on a piece of paper, on chart paper, and we could do a gallery walk and share that together. So I'm just going to be sharing little techniques as we go that can be connected to engaging all learners. So we're going to dive into second language acquisition. So as you know, since a lot of us have taken language classes, um, we don't just show up and learn a language. It's a process. OK, um, and I would love it if you could take a guess and you can put it in the chat. How many years do you think it takes to become fluent in a language. How many years does it take to become fluent in a language? And of course, this is a difficult question because what does fluent mean? We need to define that. I see one, I see two, three, okay, four, four to five, one to two, awesome. So I'm gonna go through the different stages of language acquisition. Um, and here they are. The first one is pre-production. Now I want you to know that the magic number to become truly fluent in a language where you can, you have equal access to language is seven to 10 years, mm. seven to 10 years. Now, I'm going to define this a little bit more, but we really need to define, you know, what does fluency mean? We've changed that sometime a while ago. It used to say five to seven, but that actually has grown because we've seen more about the research behind this. 
It does depend on how often and how intensely you study the immersion level. There are so many factors. And that's something as teachers and as paraprofessionals, we need to keep in mind. How can we enable language learning to happen in our schools, to happen in our classrooms? So that's what we're going to talk about a little today. So you'll see a student, if you have a student coming in, I have just this week alone, I've had three newcomers who are coming from, one was from Afghanistan, one is from um, Guatemala, and another from El Salvador. And they all are coming for different reasons, okay? But they're coming in at a level one, and we're going to talk about that a little. Now, as they enter into this English environment, they are mostly at a pre-production phase of learning, so nonverbal. We often call this a silent period. And this is so important for us to know because if you see a student coming into our classroom, we don't assume because they're silent, that means they don't know anything. That's the biggest misconception, okay? We need to allow them time to acclimate and find comfort and access some of this new language, okay? So that pre-production, um, this means they have less than 500 words in their, in their, in their dictionary, in their, in their minds of English language. They will do lots of gesturing. They will do lots of nodding to, um, you know, to show understanding. So they can use visual cues. Then as we go along, this can take about six months. It could take longer, it could take shorter, but we then enter into the early production phase. And this is where your, your vocabulary increases to about a thousand words. Um, and this is where, you know, you're gonna be rehearsing the pronunciation of words like pencil, 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 okay. Separating it into different phonemic segmentations. So just learning basic vocabulary. Then you're going to notice where students are going to become more comfortable. You're going to notice, I'm going to talk more about this, but we're going to notice they're more comfortable with their friends in the, in the classroom, at lunch. And this is where speech emergence comes through. And this is where they're starting to speak in full sentences, um, asking, you're going to notice it's more of a social language. So they're more comfortable speaking with their peers. Um, and this can last two to three, this can take up to two to three years for them to, um, you know, transition to the then intermediate fluency. Speech emergence is where they're really putting the pieces together. When we hit that intermediate fluency, that is when you know up to 6,000 words, okay? Um, and this, like I said, when you get to year two and three of language learning, this is when you're starting to string multiple sentences together. My name is Maria. I have eight years. I am from Mexico. My dad speak a little English, but my mommy knows speak English. So do you see, I still have errors, but did I get my meaning across? Yes. So we still have to build some of that. We're going to talk about it, but um, academic vocabulary and be specific about just the structure of language. And as teachers, we can do that to help isolate that. And then... Of course, the goal is to get them to that advanced fluency stage. This takes up to five, like I said, five to nine years, 10 years. It depends on the learner. So um, we really want to look at how students are learning. I'm going to show you a quick video. And I want you to compare the two different conversations. Karen, will you let me know if the sound works? Can you hear anything yet? Nope. Yes or no? No? No. Okay. So I'm going to have to stop my screen and do a new share because for some reason it's not letting me. Do you want me to play it? Yeah. Why don't I send you the link? Or can you get to it? I think it's in the slides, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. Hello. Want me to stop my share? I'll stop it. Yes. Can you just tell me what slide number? 12. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And hold on. 
Let me share my screen. Share. And slideshow. And is it? It may, um, it may pop up as a new link. So if you follow the link on the watch this video, it should show there. Got it. My goal is to make lines in the face absolutely okay. I don't believe in anti- That's my goal too. I don't think. <laughs> Where are you from? Honduras. Where are you from? I'm from California. How long have you lived here? Two years. Yeah. And you? Um, I have lived here for four years, almost four years. Yeah. You like it here? Yes. Yeah. What do you like about it? Uh, people are nice and I have a lot of friends here. Um, I especially like the food from here. Oh, yeah? What kind of food? Um, hamburgers and pizza. Oh, pizza. I like pizza, too. What kind of food do you eat in Honduras? Um, we eat a, a lot of food, but mostly I like of, um, the eggs and the beans and the cheese. Oh, do you eat that food here, too? Yeah, this yeah. is my mom makes them. Oh, what's what's the, your favorite food that your mom makes? Spaghetti. Oh, yeah. I love spaghetti. Do you like to cook? Do you help your mom in the kitchen? Yes. Yeah. What do you do when you help her? Um, I just sometimes she goes to the store with me and buy some of the things that she's gonna do for for um for the food. Oh, so you help her with the groceries? Yes. Oh, that's great. Okay. okay. Maybe learn about where plants get their energy from. So how yeah, this is what's huh? important. The first part. Now, if you could keep going, so. What's happening for me, I don't know if everyone else is having this issue. I can't see the video. The video is not moving. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem. But what's most important is that, yeah, it's frozen. But what's most important is hearing that audio. So if you could, that was the first part. So notice she was talking a lot about her favorite food, what she likes to eat. And now I want you to play the second part, Karen. Okay. Let me... Um... I'm just going back to the screen share. That's fine. Yeah, so you can play straight from here. Okay. Are the roots important to a plant? Mm -hmm. The roots of a plant takes in um, um, the the water of the um of the of the plant. Um, they they help the plants grow more if they're from. Okay. And how are stems important to a plant? Mm -hmm. um, they're important to a plant so um they, they can um get um um sun, water and some other things. Okay, you can stop. How here. do the green leaves of the plant make Okay, so I would love to know, um, and once again, you can come on if you want, or you can put it in the chat. What did you notice? That was the same student, okay? And the first half and the second half were two different examples. Are you going to, you want to keep going, Karen? The two. Yeah, you can keep going. That would be great, oh, actually. Sure. Um, so same child, right? Um, but we're talking about two different types of language experiences. Um, could anyone share in the chat what they're noticing? Um, good. We have a conversation, which is was very social. Did you notice she had more language, right? That first time when she was describing what she loved to eat, what pizza she liked. Yeah, that was all easier for her to produce. That production piece was great. Then when she was asked to speak about a reading, okay, and this was a scientific topic, it was about photosynthesis, parts of a plant, um, roots, stem, leaves, the purpose of those parts of the plant, um, all of those terms, that's the academic vocabulary. And that's what was a lot more challenging for her. And she seemed like a completely different language learner in some ways. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Good. So what this is called is um, Bix and Kalp, and you don't need to know these terms, but um, it is fascinating research that was done by um, Jim Cummings. And 
it's like he he equates it to an iceberg that language develops um, similarly to an iceberg. Um, and if you think about it, what you see on top, right? What you see on top is that social piece. So a lot of times you're going to think, oh, they know English. They're so social. They're using English all the time in the classroom, at recess, this and that. But the minute it switches to a more academic and abstract concept, they start to struggle. And that's because it's what's underneath the water. And it's it's that language that will take up to nine to 10 years to sometimes develop, okay? Think of how many times she talks about roots and stems and leaves versus talking about, I want pizza. Um, I love going with my friends, things like that. So that is... Once I learned this piece, it unlocked this mystery for me. Um, and I think you'll start seeing this with some of our some of our friends, some of our students. Okay, next, next one. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you, but um, like I said, they have changed this number. They've upped it to to around nine years, but it does kind of define for us what Bix and Kelp mean. Um, this idea that it takes six to two, six months to two years to become somewhat fluent in a social respect, in a, in a interpersonal communication zone. So think of all those interactions. But then when we switch to that academic language, um, thinking of high order thinking, that can take so much longer. And so as teachers and paras, we can do so much to help them with this transition. All right, next. And with no, yeah, that's the other piece is with no native language support, um, it can take even longer. So this is a, language is not learned alone. So really, I know sometimes we think that we should not encourage students to use their first language, but that's actually incorrect. And research shows that first language is so important to the access of their second and third and fourth language. So think about how you learn language, right? You find connections and you find meaning and you know it could depend on the type of language it is. Like when I had to learn Mandarin, it's a character language versus the Latin, the um, Roman alphabet. So that was a struggle for me, but I could still understand some commonalities. So really move away from this idea that we can't rely on or we can't use their first language to support. So this is just a little um, comic strip that says, you know, on future reports, use the term microscopic rather than itsy bitsy. So thinking about the words we use in the English language, okay? And thinking about these abstract terms, there are so many different ways we can um, express ideas, but academic language is different. It's different than the way in which we speak informally. It's more abstract, more complex. And I wrote there that it's the language of power. Now, what I mean by that is, I mean, think of that comic strip right there. Um, if we arm our students with more academic language, it opens doors for them it, professionally, um, socially. So really helping them <clears throat> become the best learner in future, whatever they want to be, um, it really arms them with as much, as many tools as possible. This is for all ages. Yes, this is for all ages. Um, and I also want you to keep in mind um, that window of opportunity to learn language. You may notice it, it's, you know, if you've ever heard of students who are bilingual, maybe one parent speaks one language and the other parent speaks another um, that sweet spot for language is really zero to three. And after three years old, it's not that we can't learn a language, but the neuroplasticity, which is our, all those connections in your brain, um, they start to slow down and it's harder to create these pathways. Okay. So yes, it is for all ages, but if we really want our students to um, become fluent in a language, the earlier we start this process, the better. And that's for anyone. All right. And once again, I really want to focus on, I think often we think of English language learners as coming into our classrooms with deficits or things that they're missing. 
But actually, and this is what I tell all my students, they have a superpower, okay? Knowing more than one language opens doors and it their brains are literally stronger than others who don't know more than one language. And I say, your brain is stronger than mine because I'm not fluent in another language. So it is. there's no deficit to fix. And this is a quote that brings that out, right? That they are whole students that have knowledge. We just have to find a way to access what they know. So that's what our job is, right? All right, next slide. So how can we do that? One example is giving them accountable talk stems, providing them with keywords, really digging in to helping them become confident in using language, using English. All right, next. Um, and I just love this comic too. Um, <laughs> Asset-based is looking at everything that we have already. Look, look what we've got. This is awesome. But then often in our schools, we're just pointing out those big holes. But look at what we're missing. Oh, gosh. And if we focus only on what's missing, truly, I believe firmly and research also supports this, that if we don't start looking at their assets and what they can do, then they're going to really be struggling for a longer period of time because they'll be able to grow based on where they're starting rather than just focusing on their faults. So something to think about. All right. Um, so how do you know the language strengths of your students? If we were together in a big room, we would do a time paired share where we really interact because interaction is a huge piece to language learning. Um, and we will be talking about that as well. But I want to give you a little bit of time if you want to put it in the chat again or if you want to jump on. How do you know language strengths of your students? Do you know where they are in language learning? Could you put them on that ladder of language acquisition? If you don't know, I would love to know. I have no idea. That's that's a fair answer to put in the chat. Um, if you do know, you could say, I know because the homeroom teacher told me or they're labeled EL in whatever computer programming you use. Um, so I'd love to know, how do you know the level of language learning in, of your students? Laura, I'm, you're going to monitor the chat because I can't monitor the chat and project because my computer won't. Okay. I got it. All right. You listen to the conversations. You listen to the conversations when they're with other students. Excellent. So you can, my high school kids will tell me or look at me funny. Okay. So reading their body language, right? Yeah. You guys can walk into a room and you, like I said, from that first quote, you see things that a lot of teachers can't see. You see those uncomfortable grimaces or just feeling overwhelmed and you can see that they're not understanding. You said, I think for me, since it is a very early level, it is when they begin reacting to and using the language. Yes, but I do want you to know, and we're gonna talk about this in a second, that what comes first is that receptive language. So even if they're not producing words or producing written language, that doesn't mean that they're not understanding. And I think that's another hard piece to this. Um, I don't know yet. They are new within the last month. Assessment yet to come. Good. Watch to see if she follows directions given to the whole class. Good. So lots of observation. Now we're going to go to the next slide. Be oh, you're there. Sorry. Um, and this is going to be I do have access, so it's hard to see right here, and I don't expect you to, um, this is not a test, right? But I do want you to know that our states, all of our states are what's called WIDA state. And we have a summative or a once a year assessment that looks at their language. And we're, they, we give them a number, one through six. So one is that entering level, which is what, it, it coincides, it connects with that ladder that I mentioned. So that pre-production phase is level one, and then developing, beginning, developing, expanding, getting more and more. And then you're going to notice that students really kind of stall, not stall in a bad way, but it takes longer for them to go from a three to a four, because that's where that academic language is really going to become apparent, that they have 
they have more more gaps that we need to support. Um, most states pick every state has the autonomy or the chance to pick a number that is required to pass in order to no longer receive that label of ELL or ESL learner. So for Maryland, our number is a 4.5. So if we give that assessment, the WIDA assessment, and they get a 4.5, and it's a total of four tests, um, they no longer will receive services because they are bridging now and they're able to, they've bridged the language gap and they're able to access, okay? So I wanted to just give you a little background. You have every right and every power, you should have all the power to ask your teachers that you work with, who are my English language learners and what are their levels? Because this is that key that will unlock so much learning for them, okay? Um, I know it's just one tool, it's one test, right? That's another thing I wanna mention, but it is valuable. So Karen's gonna go to the next slide. And when we give this assessment, there are four tests. We just finished testing 260 ESOL students four times. That's a thousand tests. It was a mammoth. It was such a huge job, but it's important to look at all four, we call them language domains. So if we think about how we use language, you can write it in the chat too, but we read language, we write language, we listen, we speak, okay? And all of those things are not the same. They require something so different. And so there are four tests because they're going to develop in different, in different timeframes and in different ways. And you are also going to see sometimes that students will struggle with one piece, but maybe not another. And that may be surprising as well. So think about that as you, um, as you kind of observe your learners. And this is for every learner as well, because you're gonna start seeing this across the board. So the input is what's coming in and then the output. So this, again, I did provide this if you're very interested and wanna read more, this is what we as ESOL teachers and classroom teachers really have, the goal is to use these levels to focus on what they can do. So if we just focus here on a level one entering language learner, okay, and we look at what they can do in terms of listening, they can point to pictures, they can connect picture to term, maybe, maybe, um, they can follow one step direction, identify objects, and you'll see as we go along, the listening ability will become more complex. So if we jump from that one to a level four learner, a level four expanding language learner can interpret oral information apply it to, and apply it to new situations, identify main ideas with details, infer um, role play. So you can see this language is constantly changing. Um, so there are these can-do descriptors for all four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, so I did provide this if you're interested. Um, this is another thing I do always share with my teachers um, because often they say, well, I don't know what to do with them. What do I do? I don't want them just sitting there not being able to access the curriculum. So this is called the go-to matrix and I linked it for you. But if you go to the next page, Karen, Really, we hear a lot about how can I engage my newcomers who don't know any English? Well, this is when you can look at, you know, how can we use physical gestures? How can we modify our teacher talk? How can we use labels and pictures and signal responses? And one of the big things is thinking about their native language. And Spanish is the number one language in my county. So thinking about cognates. Cognates are words that are that share similar meanings, spelling, pronunciation. So for example, chocolate, I gave you some lists here. And the minute you, you mention that to them and you say chocolate, chocolate, their eyes light up and they're like, whoa, you know Spanish? Or they're just, they feel seen and they feel um, a bit more understood. So if you're able to look up, if you know a student is coming from a different country, look up their language and put in cognates cognate list, English and Russian, or whatever it may be. And that can really be powerful. So these are just a few things just to get your brain thinking of things you could do to help make those 
newcomers feel a bit more welcome and comfortable in the classroom. Great, Laura. It's, I never thought about that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, and so I did mention this and, and I won't spend a ton of time, but I really don't want us thinking that we don't want them using their first language. That is actually very harmful. We want to encourage students to use their first language, allow them to use their first language to really support that new language. Now, is this all the time? No. As they exit that first pre-production stage, you obviously want to encourage them to use their first language less and less, but you always want to encourage that you are linking to this, to their, to their first language. Um, and I will say one of the biggest issues I have that as ESL teachers we have is when a student comes in from any country and we're trying to figure out where they are in, in learning in general, the first thing I ask is, are they literate in their first language? Think about that. Are they literate in their first language? If the answer is no, they don't know how to read, they don't know how to write, do you think they're going to have an easier road ahead of them compared to a student that is coming in that's been at school and has their first language literacy skills? We always feel like we've won the lottery if a student comes who's been in school since you know kindergarten through fourth grade and they're coming in as a fourth grader and they, they have all this fourth grade background, but it's in Spanish, that's okay. They have, they have so much knowledge that we can use. When it's really hard is when a student comes with interrupted schooling or never went to formal school for various reasons, for traumatic reasons. And now we're throwing them in a fourth grade setting and they can't read an out, they can't identify the letter sounds. So it's very interesting to really think about language and how it opens up doors for our students. All right, next one. Um, and this really is more for if, if you're, I think often we think, oh, they can't do anything. They need special education services. Well, actually that is against the law. If you're able to say that your student is struggling because of um, their first language ability or because of the lack of English language, then that means that that is not a learning disability. It is not a learning disability to be learning a new language, okay? So we need to look at all the different factors. You know, what was their schooling like in their, in their native country? Um, what are the interventions we're doing? What, you know, tr what's something really important is to fight, fight, fight to have them assessed in their primary language. Have them read in Spanish to see what are their skills and also to ignore cultural differences. So, you know, a student who's coming from Afghanistan, for example, um, may a lot of Middle Eastern countries, but also some other, I don't want to generalize, but um, it can come across as being rude because they don't want to look at you and but that's cultural. There are so many cultural differences that can affect language learning as well. So we really wanna be weary of that. Now, um, Karen, we yes, we are 10 minutes away from being done. If you can oh, I know. It, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> but if you wanna zoom ahead to questions, I can just do quick, I won't show the videos, but I could just show some of the focus that they could um, bring with them into the classroom. Sure. So let's, is it okay to hold on questions and we'll zoom through? Yeah, yeah we can do that on the, at the end. Yeah. I mean, yep. The other thing we can do is just do a round two. I mean, I'd be, this is enough for a round two. I'll tell you that. So I almost feel like what we should do is stay where we are. Let's stay where we are. And then just add another one and then we can email all of you. I would you love it. Round two. <laughs> I also don't want to speed things up and I want you guys to have access to this information. I'm passionate about it. And I think that it's something that you can take and really feel empowered that you're making a change um, with these kids. Because what we haven't gotten to, to me, is what the amazing impact you guys have. And what that is, if you look at this Maslow's hierarchy of school needs, in order for a student to get to that top of that pyramid, able to actually learn 
and access information. We have to start with their psychological safety, their safety in general. Are they feeling, do they have basic needs met? Are they, do they have a bed to sleep in? Do they have clothes? Are they experiencing any traumatic events? And then that piece of belonging. Um, so in our classrooms, really, you may think like, well, what, what academic piece do we need to focus on? Number one is smiling and welcoming them and finding ways to connect and build relationships. And that's where you have such pot potential as paraprofessionals because you build relationships with more students than most people in the school. So just thinking about how powerful that relationship is and how that enables learning more than almost anything because it builds their esteem. It builds their sense of safety. And then they're feeling ready and able to learn. So that, that's what next session will be. Um, is going into some strategies to help get to that top of the pyramid. Um, but we can stop here because you guys are doing these things. So, and I think what we should do now is maybe if you want to put any questions that you have in the chat and Laura can address them. And then in a minute or two, I'm just going to go to the end of the slide deck to tell you a little bit of contact information and some upcoming events. So why don't you just go ahead and... And, and Laura, I don't know if you can get to the list of attendees too, to see if anybody wants to raise their hands. Yes, I can. And just chat, because that's a perfectly beautiful yes. thing to do. So if anyone wants to raise their hand, I have access here. So let's see. Or even just something you want to share, experiences. Should I correct the child's language in conversation? I think that's a great question. I think it depends. Um, if they are a newcomer, um, I would give them a little time, right? But if you're noticing the same, the same errors again and again, that is an opportunity, right? So maybe getting out flashcards, building words where they're dropping the S, right? Because that's often sometimes what's happening is they're saying, they're, they're dropping the plural or whatever it may be. I think it can be very powerful to use those errors to then use it as a learning opportunity. Um, but I think you could also pick and choose if they're able to get their point across. Um, sometimes let that go, right? Um, so I think it that's not an easy yes or no, but I think it depends on the child, depends on your relationship. And maybe you could use it as like a little mini lesson where you can say to the classroom teacher, hey, can I just pull them aside for two minutes and talk about plurals, whatever it is? Um, so yes and no. Great question, though. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking at to see if anybody raises their hand. No hands. Okay. It's okay. I understand. So, um, and just, you know, in the next minute or two, if you want to just write in any other questions that you have, I'm going to, I want to make sure that everyone knows that We've already had two sessions, um, sorry, one session on February 6th that was called Effective Prompting and Error Correction. And if you missed that, the we have a YouTube channel that's open access. So all you need to do is go to YouTube and then in YouTube, search Demonstrated Success. And there's going to be a playlist with these webinars. So that's available for you. Laura and I will talk this week and we'll schedule something for April where she can do the second half of this session because I would hate to rush it. I think it's really good stuff. And um, in the next 48 hours, you will get a certificate of completion of the webinar. And I will actually, what I'll do is um, it'll be for half of the webinar and then you're going to get the slides and in the slides, all the links are live links, which will take you to the resources. I did also want to tell you about June. We're having a co-teaching institute and paraprofessionals are invited along with their classroom teachers and also classroom teachers that are co-teaching. So either paras and teachers, classroom teachers, or teachers and teachers, or anybody that you're co-teaching with. And we're going to have a two-day institute that we would love to see any of you at. Um, and you can just reach out about that and your, um, 
you can reach out to Laura or to me, or probably it's better to reach out to me. And I wanted to make sure that you knew how to do that. So there I am, Karen Monzo at Demonstrated Success, and Laura's up there too. So any questions that you have, or if you just want to connect with her and learn some more, then have at it. Absolutely. Thank you guys for showing up. That's the hardest part, right? Showing up.